Welcome to the Emissary Authors Podcast. My name is Paul Edwards. This is my co-host and partner in crime, Jason Todd. And we are excited to bring you this week's episode. We're going to interview uh, an old friend of mine going back a few years now. Uh, we appeared on each other's shows. We linked up through a podcast network where there was an exchange for hosts and guests and people who were doing both, and we were doing both. And so uh, we really hit it off. And uh, when it came time to look for people who had experience marketing books, which is what we're going to talk about today, I thought we got to get this this gentleman on the show. So Andrew Kaplan is going to join us for this episode. And Jason, he's going to share with us how, um, a, a book that he has now since written uh, called The Three Words I Used to Sell 100,000 Books. But the, the book that he actually sold 100,000 copies of was the book I first interviewed him about. Uh, interviewed him about, which is called The Last Law of Attraction Book You'll Ever Need to Read. And so this is going to be an exciting interview. Well, one of the things I'm most excited about with this interview is the, the, the pra or are the practical steps that he took instead of the theoretical steps that he took, you know, do this and hypothetically you'll get these results, but the actual steps that he took to sell 100,000 books. And I tell you what, like we've always talked about, if you have a message that you think is going to change the world, you owe it really to the world and to yourself to get good at sharing that message. And we can all learn something from Andrew. Andrew, welcome to the Emissary Publishing Podcast. Hey, uh, Paul and Jason, thank you so much for having me. Really excited to be here. And, um, you know, in case anyone ends up looking for me after this, uh, my pseudonym is Andrew Cap. I shorten my name and I'm bringing this up because authors might face this challenge. Uh, and Andrew Kaplan was already out there publishing mm -hmm. books. So you, ne you never know what you're going to have to do to pivot when you're moving forward in something. So I figured I'd bring that up as one example where I just shortened it to Cap. It wasn't taken and I was off to the races. That's a great example to bring right out of the gate. When we're talking with authors who want to uh, name their books, a lot of times they're going to be overlapping on somebody else's book or mm. overlapping on a uni you know some universal concept that's already out there. And you type that into Google and there's already lots of results. You're wading through all of that's going to be very difficult. So you got to one of the one of the keys is hey, what what is my domain name uh, look like? Is that available? If the domain it might is available, then your book might uh, book name might be available as well. A lot, lot more we can get dig into uh, with that. But uh, the last law of attraction book you'll ever need to read, and then three words I use to sell a hundred thousand books. That is not an insignificant number. I think by some estimates, something like ninety nine percent of books never sell over a hundred copies, much less into hundred thousand. Yeah, it, it's really incredible. And, and I say this with humility. The thing that that stands out to me the most about it for me specifically, obviously, because it's personal to me, is I did this without a publishing, you know, one of the big companies, the big publishers. I didn't have their help. I didn't have some big wig marketing team. I didn't have all these, a literary agent. I didn't have all these things that were conditioned to think that we need. And I'm not saying those things aren't helpful or useful. I'm just, you know, kind of underscoring the point that, what things, what what people think might not be possible or can't be possible is a lot more accessible if you find a way of working smart in addition to working hard. And, and that's really something that drives me that I'm excited about because in the end, no matter how successful or not successful you might be in the moment, I think everyone could always stand to find smarter, more intelligent, more strategic ways of working within whatever industry they're in or, you know, for being an author and, and marketing themselves because no one is ever going to care more about your book or your project than you personally, no matter what is on the line, no one's going to care yeah. more than you. So it's really on you to be, uh, to take that extra step in responsibility of figuring out strategies that are really going to push you forward and get your book out to the people that should be enjoying it and reading it. That's mm. a good point because a lot of authors, you know, authors that speak to us, uh, expect that the publishing company, it does all of the outreach and then you know the the author is just kind of sitting there like just you know tell me what to do uh and when in fact uh, that's not the case authors typically have a rigorous schedule of their own getting the word out about what they're doing and then going on podcasts and writing blog posts and doing speaking engagements they are their own in a, in a lot of ways self-promoter yeah, absolutely. And by the way, one thing I underscore in three words I use to sell 100,000 books, everything I talk about, it isn't the way. 
it's a way. And I always underscore that because I don't want to be coming across like this is the only way to do it. And I bring that up because everyone's different. But for me, it's never been a motivating factor to be sitting in a Barnes and Noble doing a chapter reading for 30 people um, or even a New York Times bestseller. I'd much prefer to be an Amazon bestseller because even though technically you need more numbers for New York Times in that moment, Amazon is a worldwide you know, station right there and a worldwide platform. So for me, I use that as a more accessible yet also very uh, more momentous, a lot of momentum kind of standard for making sure I get out there because that's where people can find it on my book regardless of what kind of newspaper they read or or where their interest might go outside that scope because, you know, this is a little generalized, but but most everyone is on Amazon to the point where if you don't have an Amazon account, these days you're looked as a little bit of like a little strange of how come you don't at least have one thing that you've bought from Amazon yet. Mm, yeah. And so <clears throat> uh, um, right before um, we started here, Andrew, you shared um, why you wrote uh, three words I used to sell a hundred thousand books. And I wanted, I just want to briefly touch there because I think um I think you know you you built this this enormous momentum with your law of attraction book mm -hmm. and people began to look at it or or notice the results and and what happened so what happened that, that I don't want to I don't want to spoil it I want you to tell the story but you know Yeah. Well, well people did notice I was selling a lot of copies to which someone might ask, "Well, how does anyone know?" Well, it's because I kept telling people. And the reason <laughs> I kept telling people really posting on social media is because I'm looking for any excuse, any positive excuse to mention the book in some kind of relevant way. So, and it's kind of funny. I didn't even think of this or didn't even occur to me until I hit 40,000 copies. I should have done this at 5,000 and 10,000 and 25,000 and so forth. But at 40,000, it's like, listen, this is a lot. This is really significant, whether you're an independent author or not. Let me celebrate this because the thing is, Regardless of the topic of your book, if at all you can, you want to make your book the party that everyone wants to get into. And mm. you don't want some kind of stringent balancer keeping them from there. I mean, you want there to be demand, but you also want it to be a very welcoming thing. So how do I include people in the party? I tell them when I hit 40,000 in sales. I tell them 50,000. I certainly tell them 100,000. Mm. And, you know, obviously I had, you know, friends in my network on social media. I had fellow authors. I had all these people in business. And they're like, Andrew can we get on the phone and, and talk about this and you tell me what you're doing here? And in the beginning, I could do that, but more and more people kept asking. And I realized, listen, you know, as, as much as I care about my friends, I can't for free. I feel bad saying, oh, I'm going to charge you money, I, I, you know, because the rate will be ridiculous for people. They're like, I thought we're friends. I, I couldn't sustainably like keep just teaching people. I said, you know what? Let me put this in a book. And let me like break down everything so there's no question so that the next time somebody asks me or what's happened even after that is like, I've got a friend, Andrew, who you don't even know and have no stake in, but I, I'd like you to get on the phone call with them. I can say, listen, this thing is only $4 on Kindle. It's everything that you need to know. If you had other questions past this, that's one thing. But without at least having this kind of foundation that lays out the whole playbook, a call would would almost it'd be a waste of both our time. So yeah. now I've got this thing where anytime someone asks me, anytime they know success, Andrew, what's your secret? Well, I'm not keeping it to myself. Here's this book I wrote called Three Words. I used to sell 100,000 books. Read it. You will, I would hope, not be disappointed at all in the direction I go because three words is kind of like this, you know, this mystery thing here. It isn't just the three words. It's how you use the three words. It's how mm. the three words informs every aspect of your strategy from marketing to interviews, to the cover, to the title, to anything else that you're doing. It's, it's using those three words in a highly leveraged way. And that's what I wanted to get out for people. And that's why I wrote the book. And then I went back to business as usual, promoting more of the, like the law of attraction stuff, which I'm comfortable in both, but that's, the stuff that I enjoy, which is why I went back to that afterwards. Mm. Yeah. So, um, so I guess, you know, the next obvious question to me is what are the three words? But I realize that it's, it's, you know, it's not a magic spell. So mm -hmm. let's talk about those, but let's also talk about, um, how you're, how you leverage them and, you know, what, what do they mean in context? 
Right. And so here's the, the delicate thing, because I don't want to hold back on you, but I want to, I want to preface this before we even go in that direction. The three words on their own are almost disappointing. Mm -hmm. And I usually have people read the first couple of chapters of the book before they hear the three words. But, but here's a little spoiler alert for people. If they go on Amazon and they click the free book preview in that they're not even spending money, they go on the preview, they will hear the words before, like before they have to spend money. So they'll know I will give this much. The spirit of these words is about looking out for the reader in a way that nobody else is. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that is what can you do? And uh, also another disclaimer, while this is good for fiction, it's really good for nonfiction. What can you do to make your content a true impact in that reader? Not something that they buy the book and you're done with them and great, I got my sale. But what can you do where that 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 content not only gives them the result that the title was promising them, but goes above and beyond in shifting their beliefs and shifting their understanding of the topic so that any limits that they might have been holding in front of themselves are either completely wiped out or at the very least really depleted, like, like just gone. And yeah. so it's all about positioning this in a way that you are serving the reader on a much higher level and at a much higher standard to the point where you're probably going to look back at your book before even publishing it and saying, something's got to change. I've got to step this up even more in a lot of different ways. Mm. Mm. Cause that's where the recommendations come from. That's where the five star reviews come from that people end up reading and helping them decide if they're going to get the book. That's where people come out of the blue that you've never heard of asking you for interviews. That's where you get on to summits that are being attended by thousands of people online because the hosts heard about your book and they saw your your uh, you know your style of, of content delivery and because they saw you on interviews and they're like, oh, this person, he isn't just a talking head. He actually cares. And I want to look good by featuring him or recommending him because I know by association, if I recommend Andrew to somebody and I recommend his book to someone, I am trusting that they will relate me with their positive experience with this book. So I'm not only happy to do it, I'm excited and motivated to do it because it serves me as the person recommending it. That's why you do things like that. So one, one quick question, and then I want to hear what Jason has to say. Um, in, in your answers there, and this, this may be tricky for our, our podcast listeners who are audio only listeners later on. So this mm -hmm. is, you know, theater of the mind stuff in your answers. Did you use the three words? Um, very nearly. Yes. Very, nearly. very okay. nearly. I was, I was wondering, in other, in other words, actually, let's say, let's say someone said these running. Are the words. <laughs> yeah. Let's say someone uh, uses the word running, but maybe the book title has the word run. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like, I kind of snuck the words in there. Okay. Okay. Good. I'm, ju <laughs> I'm just for a bit of fun there. And then Jason, I want to hear your question. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, Penn and Teller's fool us, uh, where they, you know, there's a magician out front and then they kind of, they guess, you know, have to yep, guess what's the they trick. <laughs> figured out what the trick was. And they're like, I think I snuck a few words in there. The kind of tell, you know, told you, we know what you're doing. One of the things that stands out for me and what you're talking about is, uh, an author needs to reconcile the concept of, of what they want to say. And with uh, how that impacts the uh, the reader, and one of the one of the things I uh, Paul has heard me say this too many times, probably, but I just kind of I when we talk with authors, I'm like, okay, so why should I care? And 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 it's uh, it sounds abrupt to 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 people when you're like, yeah, okay, why does your reader care? Because the default is I don't care, and that's just how people think. It's very, it's very like I don't care about that, right? It, it, you know, even even to say, well, you know, what would you like for dinner tonight? I don't care. That's not true. You do care. It's just this shorthand. I don't care. So then, if we if we take the shorthand and go, well, why does your reader care? If you can't say it, if you can't uh, articulate the message very bluntly to the reader as though we're like, we have to hide this. It has to be so unique and wonderful and amazing uh, that they've uncovered this diamond and and toiled to go get it. 
uh, maybe we're doing maybe an author is doing a, the reader a disservice by not just being very bl blunt uh, in their in their writing process. This is why you care. I I'm caring for you by by thinking about why you care. Yeah, and you know, also especially again as non like fiction is its own set of rules and drawing them into the story and things of that nature. But when you're talking about nonfiction and you're talking about you know, someone learning something or doing something or improving an aspect of their life. Believe it or not, even after they've purchased your book, um, and it's hard, it's going to be hard for authors to hear this because no one knows our topic better than we do in our own minds, mm -hmm. um, which can actually be a fault because that means we might not even be explaining it as well because we might say a sentence and we have an understanding of a thousand other sentences that aren't being said with it, whereas the reader never got those thousand sentences. So it's a new challenge. For me, when someone buying my book, they've spent money on it, they've invested, they're waiting for the mail or they're downloading on Kindle or Audible or whatever. To me, that is not an indicator that I've got their attention yet. For me, I resolve from the, from the very first page to fight tooth and nail to keep their attention because I realize that if I lose their attention, they've got Notice I call it the last law of attraction book you'll ever need to read because I know they've got at least 20 other law of attraction books on their shelf. And I guarantee you they have not read all those in their entirety. They read the first five in their entirety, maybe, maybe the first six, and then they'd read the first three or four chapters from one. Then, oh, this is nothing new and moving on. For me, I have a copywriter's background. I view the book as a, it's a 208 sales page. It's a sales letter. It's not selling you on buying a product. It's selling you on why and how the law of attraction works. And most importantly, why and how you could finally implement it where you failed in the past on all the other books. In order for me to successfully do that, as a copywriter, there has to be a flow and a cadence from word to word, sentence to sentence, paragraph to paragraph, chapter to chapter, that delicately and effectively and elegantly builds where each chapter is building on the foundation of the prior thing. Two minutes ago, I said, they don't know the other thousand sentences, but if I give them the sentences first, and then I start stacking other sentences that have that in mind, now I'm strategically finding a way where everything is building up almost like a crescendo, almost like a song where you're hitting the chorus and the bridge. I really view rhythm and pacing as a very necessary aspect in addition to a couple other things, because if they don't read the whole book, they're not going to be excited and motivated to use what it teaches. Therefore, they're not going to get the result. Therefore, they're not going to rec recommend it to other people. So therefore, they're not going to give it a five-star review. So it's all about being selfishly selfless in that I'm going to go out of my way to give them an experience and an understanding of the content that they've never had before, knowing that it serves them and it serves me because this should always be a win-win situation. The, the author and the reader should both get huge wins out of every reading experience that anyone has with the book. Hmm. You bring up yeah. a great point that many people buy books and never read them. And especially yeah. now, you talk about being on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Amazon is all about impulse buying. The vast majority of products are purchased actually just because it said, hey, people also buy this with it. It's like, oh, I guess I'm okay. <laughs> I got $5. You know, and I'll get to that. I'm going to buy that Audible book and I'm going to listen to it in the car on my next road trip that I never take. And and suddenly there's, you know, an Audible subscription and 20 books sitting there that you've never listened to. Uh, and I hate to count myself among those people, but it's true. And so we, we sometimes have, like you talk about, uh, we've caught this person in this, this, uh, this point of need, and then the, it sort of fades away. Then they get their mm -hmm. book and then they start digging into it. And now we have now now we're at the new challenge. Now we're unfolding a storyline for them to engage in rather than just saying, hey, you know, this was so meaningful to me. It must be meaningful to this reader because they clicked buy. That's not necessarily true. Yeah. When as soon as they open that book, we have to re-engage them. Yeah. You said like, you know, what's in it for me? You have to answer that question on every page in some way, shape or form, even if it's. Yeah indirectly you have to answer why should i continue why should i read the next paragraph why should i read the next page why should i read the next chapter you've, yeah. you've got to you've got to answer it and at least have that mindset because listen that, that's a really high standard and i can't even tell you whether i hit it or not but if you're thinking that way you're going to hit it often enough that you're going to carry them through the book because they'll they'll let you slide on one page not that you should think that way and give yourself that room 
but they will. So that when you do, in the midst of everything, have a failure here and there to really give them enough reason to go on, you've already earned enough equity with them prior to that, that they're like, okay, this really good point that Andrew made, that's earned, they're not saying this consciously, they're thinking this subconsciously. This really good point that Andrew made, that's earned them at least another 12 pages of reading to see where we go from here. Mm. You know, this makes me think so much, uh, Jason, of, you know, the time we spend working with authors to really think about, you know, what are you going to put on the cover of your book? Because uh, unless you are an established, globally famous person, and even those people don't have a whole lot of luck pushing their books off the shelves, even if everybody knows who they are. Um, but especially if you're not, you know, if you don't carry that reputation, you got all of a few seconds to hook people's attention surrounded by several other titles they could look at. Why should they look at yours? Right. And if you don't do the homework of researching the reader, understanding what's important to them, and then structuring your title and especially the, the upfront content, uh, you know, whatever introduction and forward and, and, uh, preview you give them of what they're going to get when they get in there. If you don't really focus in on that and, <clears throat> and make it interesting for them to keep turning pages, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And it's, it's, it's exactly what we spend a lot of time doing is talking, talking authors off the ledge of saying, well, I'm going to call it, uh, you know, some, they, they have some title and it's like yeah, that, you know, exactly what that means. But the rest of the world has no clue what that means. They have no idea why it's important to you. They have no idea what, it, you know, none of that. On the other hand, if you know something that you have successfully communicated to someone else to the point that they've bought it from you or responded to it and engaged with it and adapted it to their own life, then you've got a concept. And now the duty is, as you say, as we always tell people, right, is to get really good at communicating that in a written format without the benefit of eye contact and body language and proximity and intonation. And so anytime you're any, anytime that comes along, um, that's a, that's a brilliant strategy to say, I have to, I have to earn their attention with each page that's passing. And yeah, I might be, able, you know, 60 pages in, I might be forgiven for going a little bit to the side, but especially in that first little section, I've got to be like, pay attention and, and, and here's why, right. And give them a reason to. So I like that. Mm. And if I could real quick, Paul, just to speak to, you know, you're mentioning about like, I want to call it this and you're like, well, that's great and everything. But again, and I, sp I see this as a fellow author. I'm not um, separating myself or putting myself on a pedestal. When I say this, authors have a certain measure of ego mm -hmm. and they have a certain artistic vision that they want to follow. And also they, don't, they probably don't even admit th this to themselves, but they want to look good for their friends and family. And what's going to look good for your friends, from your friends and family? Well, a book with a cool sounding title. All right. But the problem is, especially when it comes to nonfiction, cool can be also confusing. Yeah. Cool can be the death of clarity. Now, me, my strategy, my perspective is to check my ego at the door, and rather than worrying about a cool-sounding title, and maybe I'll get one anyway, but rather than worrying about that, I prefer for the title to sound useful mm -hmm. because that's what it comes down to. You want it to sound like, oh, you want to answer that question of what's in it for me if I buy this book? Yeah. Answer it with the title. Yeah. Don't do Because like you said, you, know, you only got a few seconds for someone's attention. If they're like... Again, and people, again, we project, we assume that the attention that we put, put on this title is going to transfer to everybody there, but they've got kids screaming in the background. They've got their boss on their back about an email they're supposed to return. They're stressed out over their finances. They're scrolling all over social media. Their attention and their minds are scattered. If you give them a title that they've got to decipher, they're just going to give up and move on because they're scrolling through Amazon looking for an answer, looking for a problem that's going to solve their pain. Yeah. So me, I like I, this, I make it straightforward. I make it obvious. I do make it sound obviously intriguing, sure. but I'm not worried about it sounding cool. I just want it to be really useful. I want them to go, huh, I will click on this listing and let me let me read the um, the book description. Oh, that looks good. And I can see it's already at least, you know, four point something stars. Let me scroll down and read some of the reviews. Let me do a little. 
I'm, I'm enough on this. I'm going to research, or maybe I'm just going to buy it now. Yeah. Like whatever it might be, you just want to get them. You want to get them to that point. And of course, above all else, you want to deliver on your promise when they actually get the book, you want them that, that hope that they put out, you know, that they invested in when they spent that money, you want to actually be able to deliver on that. You don't want to be just another book that ends up on the shelf or in their basement. You want to be the book that stays on their nightstand because it's so valuable. They want to keep it there for a reference reference guide, even though your book was also so clear that they understand everything already. Yeah. That's the kind of book that you want. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the things that you've done now, tactically, now that we've built, built all this up. You're going through the process, and I remember seeing some of your posts about it and, and you know, and all of that. And I'm like, that's a good strategy. I was thinking to myself at the time, but I want the audience to hear some of the practical steps you took tactics you used, um, to just keep building towards that hundred thousand copies sold figure. Absolutely. Again, reminding this is a way, not the way. Mm -hmm. Um, well, let me, uh, let me see that the thing that I did when I first launched, because Maybe there are authors listening to this who have the benefit and the luxury of an audience, but maybe you don't. So for those that don't, what do you do? Or for those that do, what can you do to even further enhance that? So there were two things that I did. One was free and one cost money. I was strategic with spending the money. The thing that I did for free, you know, again, this is the law of attraction book. I went on Facebook and I found a bunch of law of attraction groups. Maybe there was 50,000 people in the group. Maybe there was 2000 people in the group. I don't care. I joined them all and I started dropping value bomb after value bomb after value bomb, establishing myself as someone that knew what he was talking about and that could explain it in a useful way. And I even repurposed content for my own book. So I didn't have to worry about coming up with new stuff, even though I also did come up with new stuff. I was able to repurpose all the blood, sweat and tears I'd already put into that creative effort. And we know how Facebook groups work. You can't be like, by the way, buy my book. By the way, here's a link to click on. By the way, this is me rudely hijacking the forum so that the moderator is going to kick me out. Like, no, you can't do any of that. Yeah. So what I would do instead is I drop value bomb after value bomb after value bomb to the point where people are like, who is this guy? And then they click on my profile, which I have complete control of and can have the huge picture behind me with the book and five-star reviews and all these readers and claim methods. And then they scroll down and I'm posting all the photos of five-star reviews. Like I can advertise, but I'm first going to get them excited enough that they click into the zone where I'm not going to be worried about getting kicked out by the moderator. Yeah. So I basically hijacked this free content consumption machine and moved it over to a place where I could then tell the reader all about me and motivate them to check out the book. But speaking of Facebook, what I didn't do, again, this is not the way, this is a way, is I did not advertise on Facebook because Facebook is a place where people are just scrolling. And the last thing I want to do is try to get them to spend money and get off their scrolling and get off, you know, checking out their ex-boyfriend and ex-girlfriend who's cheating on who, what's going on and, and try to get them in Amazon. No, I advertise natively on Amazon because that was a place where people were not only in a buying mode, but they were already looking to buy something like my book. Mm. So I was a very strategic and efficient. If I'm going to spend advertising money, let me spend it in a place where people are looking to buy where like, you know, we're talking about impulse buys where they can't wait to spend that money. And they're looking for a book with similar title. Let me put it. So I had the yeah. free version and getting as many people as possible to learn about it. I had the paid version, but in a smart way, I had a title that works. I have a cover that works. I have content that hopefully works. So it's all like this ecosystem of, of everything coming together, but it was anchored by the free social media tactic, Facebook thing, and by advertising natively on Amazon. Mm. And so those are like the major, it, it, like it, in, in some ways it sounds like super simple and but there's context to it and there's um there's a process you're following there right um yeah, well, to, to to get that well also that's that's the beginning part like what happened like can't by the way it could be a little draining to keep doing facebook i mean i believe it or not i i did it so much that within i think 10 days of doing it facebook flagged me because i was posting too much because i was copying and pasting mm -hmm. the same thing in all these groups which by the way the way uh, i got around that was um, I started changing the first and last sentence. So I didn't have to do all this extra work. Little tip for people yeah. there. I'm not sure if the algorithm still lets you do that. But 
um, that doesn't exist in the vacuum. You can't just do that. What I then did was I compounded on it. This is where I'm going on interviews and hopefully over delivering on my on the value and on the presentation. This is where I'm starting a YouTube channel. This is where I am doing a bunch of other things, but it's all a building thing. I, I can't do everything at once in the beginning, but as things are happening and as there's momentum, I could say, okay, now it's time to post a YouTube video. I can yeah. get people feeling really good and really welcome to email me because there's the stigma that authors are too busy for their readers and don't get back to them. I could be the guy that gets back to his readers. I could foster that environment. And then when I get really important questions, I could use that for video content on YouTube. So all of a sudden I'm serving the reader. I'm making them feel good. I'm, I'm giving them more bang for their buck without charging them anything. And I'm getting awesome content because they're asking me a question that I can use to post on YouTube to push more people to the book. Yeah. Yeah. You bring up an important topic in all of that. On, and something else that I like to talk about is, you know, the, if you build it, they will come philosophy is not true uh, because the default mode is you're, who are you and why should I care? And, and there is that hurdle for any, any, anything new in our lives, any new relationship, any new book where you got to get, why should I care? And the, the percentage of people who really, really, really care enough to dig down deep, it's pretty small. Uh, whereas what you're talking about, you know, people who just have a general interest in law of attraction or, you know, the roots of that, they might be hanging out there. And as you intercept their normal consumption of educational, but a lot of entertaining content, you know, it's, 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 it splits the difference. Um, then, then all of a sudden they start to, to see you more. They start to expect that you're going to chime in on a particular topic. That you're going to give them something that adds value tangentially in their lives which now causes them ironically to be attracted to you, uh, which, you know, I think many people, the authors that we talk to, they are resistant or don't believe that there's a process of putting in work to get yourself out there. It's not just you write a book and anybody cares because the default mode is they don't. Yeah. yeah. People, people think that the second they publish the book, their work is done. And I'm like, no, the second you publish your book, the work is just beginning. Yeah. Because no one's going to market it for you the way you can. No one's going to do it but you. No one has understands your book like you do. It's It's got to be on you. And and by, if you want to hire people, just make sure they understand you well. Um, make sure they're really get Like if you have the, the, the budget for it, I kind of have the perspective of like, let's assume that we have a, a new author with no audience, no budget. Can they run the ship themselves? Well, depending on your schedule, depending on your interests, depending on your care, it's certainly possible. It's a question of whether you're going to do it or not. Yeah. So getting back to that, then walk us through, let's say, oh, uh, the, the timeline or the activities during a typical week when you're in that, uh, in that um, marketing mode. What should well, the author expect? So, I mean, cause there's, there's like the launch itself and then there's just a the continuation, right? I mean, if, if you're talking about the launch, well, for me, it's, it's like a 24 seven thing where I'm, I'm prepping the Facebook post. I mean, I used to, now that I have an audience, I leverage it differently. Um, but since it's about three words, I sell a hundred thousand books and starting kind of like from zero. Um, it was all about doing the heavy lifting of researching the Amazon. I was um, looks all right. So we got Amazon keywords that I'm looking to do. We've got Facebook content, Facebook posts. We've got going through my book and saying, okay, what is the stuff I can repurpose? Um, I I've gone through different situations of hiring people to um, to get me booked on podcasts and kind of reaching out myself. So it's really in the, especially in the beginning because you really care about your product and you want to invest in it. Um, it's, it's every waking moment and some people have job like the not like nine to fives. I positioned my days so that I could give that much. And if, if there was a job that was interfering, well, it's like, okay, well, how many hours do I have? I have eight spare hours. Well, that means I'm using eight hours to do this. Um, now once that's done, obviously you want to be very cognizant of burnout. You don't want to put yourself in a position where you just, you completely fizzle out and you can't keep doing things. So you take your foot, at least me, you take your foot off the gas a little bit, especially if you're getting momentum. But you're, you, again, you become strategic and like, all right, well, let me double my efforts on getting interviews because 
I'll, I'll be in that conversation for an hour, but then that'll reach X number of people and that'll always be online. That'll be serving me in perpetuity. Um, yeah. let me again, make YouTube videos. Let me do whatever I can. So some days it's working 24 seven other days. I'll work less than an hour a day, but that's depending if I really want to give myself permission to take the foot off the gas. And I've already got a momentum of tens of thousands of books sold at the very least before even doing that. Yeah. <clears throat> I love how the fundamentals don't change there because that's one of the, like Jason said, that's, you know, it's a struggle for some authors to think, well, I got to go and put myself out there. Yeah, you do. If you want to do this, right. If you don't, if you don't feel the message matters that much, then you won't do it. But if it's essential to you, like if it's critical, if you, if you know something that you like, this is going to change people's lives. And I've, I'm the one who's been given the message, then I've got to carry it to the market. And then you'll do stuff that, um, you know, takes energy, takes time, takes resources, takes money. Um, but it's worth it because you're getting the message into people's hands and it's affecting them in positive and meaningful ways. And yes. when you get to, when, when it gets right down to brass tacks, it's, it's, it can, it, it is, it's being seen versus not being seen being heard versus not being heard, um, talking one more time about it versus saying, shut up, never mind, wasn't, you know. And um, I think I think that's, you have to be smart about it, you have to be strategic about it, but you do have to, you do have to get out there and talk. Yeah, and so there's a lot more to it. And you know, you look at athletes and human beings are very interesting in that we intellectually get stuff, certain things, but we also automatically project and it's like, you know, you go out to a baseball game and you watch these people throw about throw on a baseball for three hours and you know that they do more than that, but your brain's only perceiving them as working three hours a day. It's like, no, they're in the weight room. They're con they're under an immense amount of stress. They're maybe looking at tape. Like if people saw, and I'm not saying, you know, they deserve those millions of dollars. That's up to you. It's like, what is the market um, demand? Who cares? It's a whole different conversation. But if people saw how much a professional athlete spends, like how much time they spend, how much effort and energy they expend so that they can go out for those three hours in front of a crowd, they would be floored. And a lot of people yeah. wouldn't even want to do it. No, no. Same with entertainers and, and performers. Like you watch them dancing and singing on a stage or whatever. And you think, oh, anybody could do it. No, no, it's just the opposite. That's why so few people actually do is because mm -hmm. number one, you, not everybody has the talent. Okay. That we'd have different levels of talent, but the big, uh, decisive factor there is who's willing to do the work, you know, who's willing to actually do the kind of levels of rehearsal and preparation and choreography and, you know, fine tuning with, and sound checks and, and, you know, dress rehearsals, tech rehearsals, all that kind of stuff. It's, um, it is no small amount of work. And neither is spreading a message, you know, what we tell people oftentimes is think of the lifestyle of someone running for national office. You know, we're going to go into an election year. There's two people who are going to be on the road every day of their lives, giving one interview after another, answering the same questions over and over again, right? Shaking hands, kissing babies, going to rallies, going to, going to burger joints, posing for pictures, signing autographs over and over and over and over again. And for what? Well, they care very deeply about it. It matters to them. Whatever their reasons, whatever their motives, I don't want to get into that, but it, it, it's, it, it matters immensely to them. And that's why they yeah. do it. And here's and the good, and, and the good right. news is the stuff that I'm telling people, again, a way, not the way, but the stuff I'm, I'm recommending to people, they can do from the comfort of their own home. They don't sure. have to go out on the road. They don't have to be out in the cold or the heat, whatever time of year it is. They don't have to um, face negativity in person. If that's what's going on, they could, they could sit in their office or sit in their bedroom and set up their computer, set up their laptop, set up their camera and, and just go to work there. They can do everything from the comfort of their own home if they really want to, but, st and yet still simultaneously be so invested in their message in their book. And most importantly, in their reader that they're making a real dent in the universe as Steve Jobs yeah. used to say. Yeah. Well, that underscores the necessity for putting in the effort putting in the work required to get the results there's no easy win uh and when there is it's easy it's sometimes easily lost so uh go if an author is looking to 
uh, you know, sell a hundred thousand copies, they should pick up your book. Three words I use to sell a hundred thousand books, which is referring to the other book you've got there. The last law of attraction book you'll ever need to read. Uh, give us again, a quick recap of what a author is going to learn from reading that book. Really? Well, as the title implies, you know, it's, it's me giving the whole map of what I did in order to successfully sell 100,000 copies of one of my books. And it's going to be through the lens of the three words. But again, this, the three words are not enough. It's about saying, okay, with these three words in mind, how can you be strategic in your marketing? How can you title your book in the right way? How could you make the cover that can't be missed? How can you um, put yourself in, how can you make an impression on interviews that people actually remember you? Do you want to be the podcast episode that keeps getting clicked on or keeps getting shared? How do you do these things? And by the way, how do you get away with not doing all of them if you don't want to do all of them? Like just about learning like, well, let's show you a high level way of doing 20 things and you decide, do you want to do six of them? Do you want to do 20 of them? Do you want to do three of them? Do you want to do 10 of them? Whatever it might be. And, and really for me, it's, it's just a breakdown going into all these different important things about selling a book. And then at the end, I do this wrap up chapter where I show how everything ties together from a 30,000 foot view so that when people implement any step in what I recommend, they automatically not only understand the value and power of that step, but they understand how easily it connects to any of the other things that they're talking. About. It's not even in the within the, the framework where they can just to give one piece from the book away for people. One thing I teach, I call it the Amazon squint test. And all this is, is when if you're designing the cover or you're paying someone to de design your cover for you with the understanding that people have a really small attention span and people are scrolling really fast. Do if your cover comes up really small on the computer screen at the size that Amazon displays it, do people have to squint to read it? If they do, if there's effort there, there's something wrong with your cover versus a thing where instantly, automatically, they can clearly read the words. They understand you're not too fancy, which means if you've titled your book properly also, they get to understand what's in it for them and they get to make a, another decision based on that. It's all about being really strategic in the context of three specific words I teach, being really smart, being really efficient, being really effective and actually reaching people with your book. And uh, I want to add to that, you use the word str strategic. Many times people think str strategy is somehow complicated. And a lot of times the most strategic things we do are the simplest things we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes. yet they're so easily overlooked when it's not a path we've been down before. It's, it's almost yeah. like we overlook it if it's too simple, not believing it could work. It's like, no, keep it simple. It works. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and try to, and, and the way you do that, I, I have always counseled our authors is, is try to picture yourself in the position of the person you would want to read your book. You know, they're picking it up at an airport. They got a flight to catch or they're browsing in a bookstore or they're just scrolling on Amazon or they're passing through social media. What would they run want to run into? What would, what would stop them? And they would spend just a little bit more time than they do. And, you know, all those elements that you're talking about, that's really important. When we did this one, more wealth, less taxes, that's one of the things I said to Lance. I was like, what's the, what are people going to get if they read your book? Well, they're going to make more money and they're not going to have to pay as much in taxes in retirement. Okay. Then let's call it more wealth, less taxes. Cause that's, that's simple, right? Anybody can look at that and say, if I read this book, I'm going to grow my wealth and I'm not going to have to pay uh, you know, an, an, a, a substantial amount of taxes. So, um, mm -hmm. all that exactly. accomplished in only four words. There you go. Yeah. Well, Andrew, uh, people can pick up your book at Amazon. That's what I heard. Where else? Yeah. Where so, else? um, yeah. obviously all my books are, yeah, all my books are available on Amazon. If anyone wants a fast link to go to all the U.S. listings, they can go to awesomemarvelous.com. But again, anyone all over the world, they just look at their, their local regional Amazon and they'll they'll find the books waiting. And if people don't want to pull out their wallet, um, if they're interested in the law of attraction stuff, I also have a YouTube channel that goes into that so they can watch all those videos for free. Everything they can find, whether it's the books or YouTube or anything else, can be found at awesomemarvelous.com. Half of those can be found at andrewcap.com. 
And uh, either way, I hope that the content serves people in any way, shape or form. Well, fantastic. I, I really appreciate digging into that with you. And uh, this three words I used to sell 100,000 books, it's to me, uh, sounds like a book that every author should read and consider the strategies involved in that before they even write their book. So they understand uh, the road ahead of them. Yeah. Well, Paul, that's uh, any 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 closing thoughts? As we like to tell uh, authors, the best time to, to market a book is before you've even written it, or and especially before you've published it. And I think, uh, Andrew, your book, um, as well as what you teach in your Law of Attraction book, are uh, fundamental to that. I've always admired and appreciated your work for that reason. We've had a great time chatting with you today. We hope to have you back again someday soon. And uh, until the next episode, my name is Paul Edwards. This is my co-host, Jason Todd, and you have been listening to the Emissary Authors Podcast. See you next time.